Welcome to the Bad Roman Podcast. On this show, we talk with veterans, community leaders, Christians, and non-Christians as we explore the entanglement of Christians with the state. The Bad Roman Project was created out of the firm belief that as Christians, we are called to follow Christ, not the state. Here is your host, Craig Hargis. Hey, folks. With every election, the topic of borders comes up without fail. This topic divides almost everyone who involve themselves with the state without fail. But as Christians, this shouldn't be a question as to how we respond. When Jesus said, love your neighbor, that includes everyone. The state is going to continue to try and divide us in any way possible. But thankfully, we belong to another kingdom. Today, I'm joined by Josh Allen, who wrote a fantastic article for thebadroman.com titled Christians Without Borders. And we're going to get into all of this today. Josh, how are you doing? I'm good, man. I'm glad to be on the show. Uh, happy to contribute to the blog and, uh, you know, doing great down here in in the the free state of Florida where we don't care about <laughs> any rules or restrictions on anything. So, you know, I'm having a good time. You're a super spreader state. <laughs> yeah, man. You know, we're, we're the devil down here. Yeah. Know? So when I, I we, we have that little private discussion group that just among people that work on the project, then we've got a regular discussion group for people that listen or follow the Bad Roman. But in that private group, I, cause I was getting really frustrated with, uh, how Christian, cause I was sitting in my break room at work and people were just in Fox news is on there. Just watch all this stuff going on at the border. And this guy looked at me, he goes, y'all got a great governor down there in Texas. And I said, what do you mean? Like, I'm not following it. You know, it's not my thing. I don't pay attention, but I said, what do you mean? And he goes, well, he's sending the national guard to the border. I'm going to stop him from crossing the border. And I just rolled my eyes and went back to eating my lunch and, <laughs> just stop paying attention. I just did, I just didn't engage it. I've engaged it before. It's not fruitful. They're not listening. So I just let them have it. They they can they can think what they want. The problem I have with it though is these folks are calling them, themselves Christians, and they're treating the, they're, they're treating these folks like they're the plague or something. It's weird. We'll get into that, but I want you to give us a little bit of background yourself before because you were on our, our roundtable at the end of the year last year and 2020. And you gave us some background then, but just in case people miss that, go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself. We'll get into your article. Yeah. So, you know, uh, like I mentioned, I'm down here in uh, the Jacksonville, Florida area, a little dinky town called Middleburg. Um, You know, I have been a Christian since I was 11 years old. And we'll talk about it. I mentioned a little bit of that in the article. You know, I go to a local Southern Baptist church. I'm a deacon, in fact, at the church. And I don't mean that to toot my own horn, but just sort of given my <laughs> Christian street cred, right, for for people who don't know. Um, and, you know, as far as my anarchist street cred, I think I took a, a very similar journey to what a lot of people did. Uh, you know, I was a longtime Republican, uh, a neocon for a long time, very, very, uh, you know, hawkish on war and, and thought that America was always right and good. Um, you know, and, and slowly things started to turn right around the time that, you know, Donald Trump, God love him, ran for office, uh, you know, became a libertarian for a while and then just couldn't square some of the wild stuff that the Libertarian Party wants to do um, with, you know, my Christian sort of worldview, things like abortion. And then realized that the Libertarians, really all they want is to become a big boy party like the the other two big boy parties. They're not really concerned in doing things long term, you know, a whole lot differently. Um, and then sort of landed in in anarchism for lack of a better term, right? Like, you know, I'm, I'm really sort of in a season right now where I'm eschewing political labels. Like people want to label everyone as either conservative or liberal, you're a Democrat or Republican, you're this or you're that. And I'm just like, I'm in the camp of doing what's right and trying to live my life in the way that I think Jesus has told me to live it. Um, you know, and that's wherever that takes me is where it takes me. And I, you know, I, I'm, I'm in the same spot that most anarchists are. We see the net negative that is government most of the time. And, and we think that voluntary associations probably in the long term are better. Um, you know, and that's, that's kind of where I am and, um, found the bad Roman project and you, uh, and all the other people associated with that with, you know, via Stephen Rose's, uh, you know, anarcho Christian stuff and sort of took a similar path. So it's kind of where I am. And, and, you know, when you mentioned, I saw your post about sitting in the break room at work and these people are talking about, you know, sending troops to the border to effectively murder anyone that comes across this imaginary line that we've decided is, is our property versus theirs. And, 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 I, and I'm with you, like, it's just very hard to square, you know, that with what Jesus tells us about how to treat people, which is 
sort of the basis of the article. Like Jesus says, love your neighbor. Guess who's your neighbor? Literally everyone, you know, <laughs> literally everyone. Yeah. I love that. And I, when I asked somebody, cause I asked them, I said, I need somebody to write an article about this. I said, it was, it was really just driving me crazy. Like I said, in the beginning, how Christians are responding to this and you offered to do it. And I was very appreciative of it. And it was, a, it turned out to be a fantastic article. It was very on point on everything. And it was everything I was looking for, for somebody to write. And I really appreciate taking the time to do that for us. And hopefully when people hear this, they will go and read your article and share it with the folks that are acting like this. You know, like I mentioned, the guy in the break room and he's called himself a Christian. And I just, you know, I've heard him talk, say things like, you know, we I'll be picking them off at the, at the border. That's not what Jesus instructed us to do. I mean, you know, I don't know that Jesus ever cared about borders. You know, it, 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 he certainly didn't care about nations, nation state. It wasn't his thing. He already, he said all the time he, he, that he has a different kingdom. Yeah, I don't, I don't think you hear Jesus, uh, you know, and I'm not saying this, uh, I'm not attacking anybody who feels that borders shouldn't exist. I don't think you hear Jesus saying like, get rid of all the borders either. Jesus is essentially telling people to shift their focus. Stop caring about what the government says is important and care about what I, you know, the, the son of God who, who has sacrificed himself, you know, for the salvation of the entire world, focus on what I'm telling you is important, you know, as, as, as. God, you know, who the, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, who is essentially the king of the universe. Like that, that's a term that we, that my church uses pretty often that I think is, is pretty neat to remember. Like God is in control of the entire universe as it stands. And, and, and you know, I think Christians sometimes need to decide, like, are you going to follow what your government tells you is important? Or, or are you going to anything, whether it's borders, whether it's, you know, healthcare, whatever it is, are you going to look at it through the lens of, is this what I see Jesus telling me is right and true and correct. And, and I don't know how anybody, um, well, I do know, uh, I was going to say, I don't know how anybody could, could think that is the biblical way of looking at things, but I do know people are biblically illiterate, right? Like the vast majority of Christians in any given church um, don't know how to study the Bible, don't know how to rightly look at scripture and interpret it and think about it, meditate on it, pray about it and ask God to show them what God is saying to them, like in scripture for any given situation and, and you have the flip side of that. You also have people that believe that they know exactly what scripture says and they have rightly interpreted it. You know, there are literally hundreds of thousands, if not millions upon millions of Christians that have come before you and I that followed Jesus. And on any given topic, you know, if you were to look through what everybody believed that the Bible was trying to teach about a certain thing, there's this wide swath of opinions and interpretations, you know. So I look at any anything where people are saying, well, this is exactly what Jesus means. And this is exactly the right way to look at, look at a thing, you know, that sort of arrogance scares me, right? Like I never want to get to a point where like the, the mysteries of God and the Bible, the infiniteness and powerfulness of who God is and what he is, I can distill down to one political viewpoint, such as we have to control the border and send troops to murder anybody who doesn't respect our border, right? It's just it's scary to me. When you were talking about the uh, biblically illiterate. I, I may fall in that camp, actually, because and when I say that, it means I like when people get into these theology debates. I don't, I don't engage it because it doesn't. It, it goes over my head a lot of the times. But what I do know, without a shadow of a doubt, that I can. That this is where I always fall back to. Jesus said, "Love your neighbor and your enemy." And I just try to keep it simple and just go try to live my life. And just in that aspect, everything else will just kind of fall into place after that. Yeah, and that's a hard thing to do. Like that's a hard, you know, and, 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 and people, a lot of people get frustrated with me. Well, you know me, you've seen me online. You've seen me. I debate people constantly. So I love a debate. I, I love getting into the teeth of this stuff and getting down to it. And let's try, try and figure this out, even if I'm wrong. But let's talk about it. Let's debate it. Because if I'm, if I'm wrong about it, that means I'm going to learn something today. But when it comes to theology and stuff, I just, I won't get into it. I just don't think that was, to me, it's not something that Jesus ever instructed us to do. I mean, he just told us to love our neighbor. <laughs> so I just try to keep it simple and, and just fall back on that as much as possible. Yeah. You know, and I, and I look at it and people, people get confused when, when I tell them things like this, like, I don't know if borders are good or bad. Like, I don't know. Like, I literally don't know. I don't know. I, I can tell you that as a human being sitting here in Middleburg, Florida, who is a, you know, quote unquote, citizen of the United States of America, I have literally zero control over whether or not we have a border. Right. I don't see a future in which we have no borders. Right. I'm not saying that's good or bad. I don't see a path to get there. 
Uh, I don't, I don't, I don't know how you accomplish that if you believe that's the right thing to do. Um, and again, I'm not defending borders or anything, right? I'm just saying, so for me, like people are so caught up on this, this border that we have to protect. And these are, you know, bad, terrible people that are coming across the border. To me, that's problematic in a couple of ways, right? Like, first of all, uh, many of the crises that people are fleeing to come across <laughs> the border were created by the American government, <laughs> You know, intervention, the war on drugs, uh, you know, toppling regimes, uh, allowing these drug cartels to bloom and blossom and become the most powerful entities. Because, you know, if we're being frank, the, the country of Mexico is controlled by drug cartels and not the Mexican government. They control the entire border. Uh, you can go on YouTube right now. There's a couple different travel bloggers that I watch that they've gone down to the border and they've talked to people not government officials, not people who who have any reason to be biased. They've just gone down there and talked to people who own property on the border. And they're telling them the real deal. There is a crisis on this border, right? It's a humanitarian crisis. It is a legal crisis. There, there, there are problems at the border. But my whole point in this article is that I don't think it's a Christian's responsibility to fix those. Our responsibility, if we're in and around the border or we encounter people who are in need, that are coming across the border, our responsibility is to love them and treat them the way that Jesus would treat them. And if we don't do that, we're not following the commandments of scripture. The camp that I don't fall in, that I see a lot of anarchists fall into where they say, well, we don't care about anything that's in the Bible other than expressly what Jesus said. Well, you can't, you can't wrangle out of what Jesus said when he says to love your neighbor. Like th those are the words of Jesus himself. The great, you know, what they call the, uh, what they call the, the, the commandments of Jesus and the things that you're learning about. God tells you the great commission. That's what I was searching for. The great commission. Jesus tells you not only to love your neighbor, but to go out and tell other people the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Right? Like, so we're looking at these things, like people see a threat coming across the border. A lot of times what I see is this huge opportunity to go and care for people and tell them about Jesus. And I think as Christians, that should be our number one priority. When we look at a crisis like the border, how does this an opportunity for us to go, uh, do the work of of actual ministry that Jesus would want us to do. Now, it's a real opportunity for Christians to be Christ-like, <laughs> to represent Christ. Yeah, you know, and I, and I and again, I see how people get to the point where their national identity as a citizen of a country is so entangled with their Christianity. In the article, I talked about this church that I went to, uh, and I'm not going to name it because I'm not trying to to shame anybody, right? Like I'm not trying to call any church out. And this was also, you know nearly 30 years ago now. I'm 40 years old, I'll be 41 next year. You know, so this was a long time ago that this happened. But, you know, you go into this church and it was essentially a high, you know, it's one of these hybrid buildings that's like a church and a big auditorium that they use for a gym or concerts and stuff too, right? And you look up in the ceiling and the whole ceiling is colored translucent tiles that hide the fluorescent lights that were in the ceiling. And it, the the color panels are the, the, the American flag, right? The stars and bars. And I think the American flag from a design perspective is beautiful, right? Like I still think it's cool. I love flags in general. I've always been a flag guy. Statist. I, you know, maybe I am a little bit, <laughs> uh, you know what? And I, you know, people make fun of me too, because I wish it wasn't publicly funded, but I love NASA. Like I love the stuff that they do. I think it's so cool. I wish it wasn't, you know, via stolen tax dollars that they accomplish that stuff. But, you know, going back to, to this church, you look up at this church and, and I'm talking to you know, probably 200 foot long by 100 foot wide American flag up in the ceiling. Like it's this huge flag. Like these people had Jesus so entwined with America that they put the American flag in the, the ceiling of, of their church, right? And, and I don't remember a whole lot. I remember bits and pieces because I was a young kid. But even other churches I went to, I don't remember a whole lot about their teaching, right? I don't remember how much of their, their, te their theology was bad in terms of, you know, marrying the state to Christianity. But I just know other churches that I grew up in here in Middleburg, we always were, when I was growing up, you know, we always ended up in smaller Baptist churches, right? And and it was very much America, America, America. America was the new Israel. You know, America was the Israel that God talks about, you know, in the book of Revelation, which is wrong, just flat out wrong. Uh, you know, spoiler alert, if you don't know this, America is actually Babylon. When it talks about Babylon, uh, Babylon the whore and all the different like wild imagery, America is just another Babylon that, that Jesus will topple in, in the end of times. Um, and people, that's a shock to people, right? Like I still know people, I, I had a conversation with somebody the other day and I told them that, like, no, that can't be right. And I send them a couple of videos. Well, I mean, if, if you, if you'd have said something like that to me back in the day, I would have thought you were crazy because I mean, I believed that I believe that I, I used to say this, that God created America to prevent people from attacking Israel. And that's the sole purpose. And I'm like, 
that now I look back, I was like, why would you even think? Have you ever been to the Lincoln Memorial in DC? Uh-uh. Bro, it is a, it is a, it is like a Greek temple. There, there's this huge statue of Abraham Lincoln and, and huge. It's got to be 40, 50 feet tall, right? Like, I mean, it's enormous. The whole structure itself has pillars like a Greek temple. Um, and in the back, there's a giant inscription. There's a bunch of stuff written all over the walls, some of his speeches and stuff that he gave. And I'm a huge history buff. Like, so it was cool to see like history come to life. And I think it's cool to walk on the streets of like our forebears and the people that did things before us that, that created certain things and accomplished big things, whether I think they were all good, bad, whatever. But you go here and behind Abraham Lincoln, uh, you know, it says in this temple, as in the hearts of of his people enshrined forever is the memory of Abraham Lincoln. I'm, I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but it's a, but it, it calls it a temple like it literally calls it a temple like they, they want people to come and worship the things that Abraham Lincoln did. Um, and before I turned into, quote unquote, an anarchist, right, like. I took this cool picture and I had a frame right on this wall behind me, this big, huge, like three foot by five foot picture of Abraham Lincoln with those words behind him. And then when I started to realize like, you know, how sacrilegious that really was, like, I was like, I got to take that picture down. Like <laughs> I took it down and like, I haven't, I haven't printed anything else to put in there. Um, but, but people get so intertwined. America is, you know, the culmination of the work that God was trying to do through Jesus. And it's just so wrong. And, it, and it's heartbreaking now to look back and see that that's, you know, some of the stuff that I believed in the past, like, you know, and you fast forward a little bit and I, I used to teach that sort of stuff, right? Like in church, like I've been a, a, you know, a Sunday school teacher for a while. Like I used to, like a lot of my lessons had that stuff intertwined there. And I just look back, you know, sort of pray to God that, you know, that he'll forgive me for sort of the sacrilege. But uh, I don't know, man, like it's just, a, it's, it's wild to see people sort of come out of the matrix, right? I, I, I've tried to explain to people like, why I'm not attached and I don't care about politics. Like people around here, they ask you like, you know, what sort of news channels do you watch? And did you see so-and-so on Fox news? Or did you see this person on CNN? Like, and it's wild to them when I tell them, like, I don't watch either of those. Like, I don't watch any news. Like, I don't care about the news. Like, I care about what's going on in my community to an extent. Like, you know, I'll find bits and pieces of info that I need, but it's kind of like coming out of the matrix when, when Keanu Reeves comes out, it's, you sort of have to relearn like so much stuff and you got to go back and re-examine things. And, You know, that's something that to this day, like even almost five years into sort of saying, wait a second, (laughs) I've mixed my love of Jesus with the love of the United States. I'm still, there's still things I find myself sort of untangling as I go along. So I think it sounds like you and I have a very similar path that we've taken. You know, you mentioned with Donald Trump and about, I guess, the same timeline as well. I'm a little bit older than you, but it sounds like the same path that I took, you know, and I've mentioned it several times on the show about when, you know, Donald Trump was nominated, I started losing interest in the Republican party with that. And it wasn't so much, I mean, the guy's a moron. I mean, he's, he's, he made a lot of money, but man, he's, he's still, the things that were coming out of his mouth was just so hateful. And it's the stuff he was saying about the border at the time. And it's funny, and we're going to get into this because people are so scared that when Biden got elected, that, He's going to let all these folks come across the border. It's not just, that's not the case. He's still locking children up in cages. And what's funny to me is because the left was always, that was one of their, their talking points. Well, was the border. And now Biden is, exa- is acting maybe worse than Donald Trump was about it. And the left is silent. It's uh, it, it, whenever uh, Biden bombed Syria, the left is silent on it. They're hypocrites. The right and the left to me, they're so hypocritical. They cannot see their own hypocrisy because they're so blinded by their loyalty to the state, to their team, to their this tribalism is such a such a horrible thing. That's one thing that attracted me to anarchy was the individualism. I've always had, always had that sense, even as a statist, I always had that sense of individualism because I didn't care about your team. I wanted my team to win because I was scared to death of your team. And that was it. But, you know, and I, and I said this before as well, when George Bush, that was the first time I've ever voted W. Bush, by the time of his end, the end of his second term, I was exhausted because you just, it's just, you can't defend this stuff. But I still went and voted for Mitt Romney. I voted for Mitt Romney because Obama, I was scared to death of Obama. And had I not found, tried to start seeking out a third party when Trump was nominated, I probably would have stayed home. I could not bring myself to vote for this man. It was just the hatred that the vitriol it was coming out of his mouth and christians were just latching on to you know the the, the right has a way of manipulating the, the christians or you know followers of christ I, I was so disappointed in a lot of friends and family that latched that voted for donald trump and were just just so supportive of him and i was like this guy's garbage 
listen to the stuff that's coming out of his mouth. There's nothing, there's nothing Christ-like about that. And that's when I started coming out of the matrix. The way he talks about women, he started running right when my daughter, right around the time he, my daughter was born. My daughter is six years old. She was born in, in 2015, shortly before, after he declared his candidacy, right? I don't remember the exact dates, but, uh, I started to hear the things, the way that he talks about women, the way that he talked about, you know, his, his sexual proclivities. Um, and I just sort of said, if that was my daughter, he was talking about, would I be okay with that? Right. And it was this bombshell in my brain. But then I also started looking at the other candidates and there were too numerous to mention. Did you vote in 2016? Did you, did you? Yeah. Yeah. I voted for Gary Johnson. Okay. Yeah. Cause I, I went like extreme third party and we voted for Daryl Castle, you know, but he, I almost voted for Daryl Castle, but he just, I don't know. I don't remember what it was. Uh, the Libertarian Party here in Clay County uh, is full of people who are very, uh, they're just very convincing people. They're very genuine people. Like they see the same sort of problems with the government that I think, you know, anarchists do traditionally. They, they haven't given up on it. They think a, a very minimal government is, you know, better than no government. And and to be honest, there are days I think that too. Like, you know, I'm not, I'm not one of these one true Scotsman uh, dudes that's going to tell you that I have everything figured out. I, I know that the government does things that are awful that, that Christians really shouldn't try to really can't square their Christian beliefs with. But, you know, I waffle back and forth on certain things like, you know, anarchism doesn't have a good answer for making sure that there is like security coverage across a whole swath of areas, right? Like private security, like there are some problems with the, you know, the political philosophy of anarchism, and I'm not saying it's a reason to not support it, right? Like th there are things to talk through, issues to talk about. But, you know, yeah, I voted for Gary Johnson in 2016. You know, this past one, I just didn't. <laughs> I just didn't. Like there was no, there's nobody I'm willing to put my name on. You know, and the same with all these local elections. There were there are all these local elections and, and there was one initiative that I voted on, like, because I'm not at the point where some people are where they say don't vote at all. We'll get you there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I you know. Uh, but there, there was a couple of defensive voting measures in terms of uh, taking more of my money where I was just aggravated. And I'm like, I'm going to go and say, no, <laughs> I'm just going to be on record as saying, nope, I think this is terrible and don't do it. Right. But yeah, you know, it, it was it's just a weird thing, man. Like the, the glue started to come off of the facade that is uh, American politics for me. Uh, you know, it, it was sort of I, I'll think Donald Trump for one thing is, is that he was sort of the one that started to dissolve that glue and, and let the the shine fall off of all this stuff that I'd been told was right and good and true. And, and at first it was pretty terrifying, especially when I sort of realized that libertarian, the libertarian party wasn't good either. You know, and I realized that I was in sort of this desolate landscape of what, what the heck do I believe? Like what is like, do you know, because you're so trained that you have to have a political tribe, right? In America, we have to have a political tribe. A huge part of your identity is who you are politically and what you believe politically. Uh, and then I found, you know, the anarcho-Christian page that Stephen Rose runs, and then there's there's the group that he runs. Uh, and then eventually, you know, found my way to the Bad Roman. And I realized, like, hey, there's other people like me that realize the government is bad. What do you call them? Anarchists or voluntarists or agorists? All sorts of different labels that people want to put on it. Um, it was it was cool to finally meet up with some people who saw the same faults and flaws and issues, and to be able to have like honest conversations, you know, about all sorts of stuff that that are taboo in the circles that that most people run in politically, right? Like, if you're a Republican, you can never question the police. Right. You can never question the military. You know, if you're <laughs> on the Democrat side, you can never question someone's pronouns. You can never, you know, there, there, there are things that are that are taboo, you know, where where whereas, you know, I will say one thing for anarchists, we can have many more honest conversations. You know, someone can come into an anarchist room and say, hey, is it good that America has a uh, military budget that is bigger than any military in the history of the world? You know, do we think that's a good thing without people just saying, oh, you hate America and you want you want our freedoms to die? You know, so it's it's pretty cool. The honest conversations that come from meeting people that are like minded, I guess, is my very long winded point that I'm trying to make. Yeah, I'm, ex I'm, ex I'm very grateful for uh, anarcho Christian because whenever I first started uh, understanding anarchy and then started how it aligned with my faith. I thought I was alone, dude. I thought I was walking around with this with mentality, like I was like, I'm, I'm alone out here. And then when I yeah, it felt so lonely. You, you know who Dave Ramsey is? I I uh, I was in his one of his Facebook groups, and they don't talk about politics. They try to forbid it, but somehow this thread got into politics. And I'm like, I'm an anarchist and I'm a Christian, 
but I'm an anarchist now because I'm a Christian. And somebody mentioned anarcho Christian to me in that thread, and I looked them up. And actually, if it hadn't been for that, we probably wouldn't have a bad Roman either. I mean, so if anybody has a problem with the Bad Roman Project, contact Stephen at anarchochristian.com and let him know. Like I said, it's like, yes, all, all the problems you have with us Christian anarchists, you can blame on Stephen. Yeah. Rose. It's all his fault. And I'm sure when he listens to this, he's going to get a chuckle out of that, but it's all his fault. And I've told him that before. I said, you've kind of started this mess that we're all involved with now. Yeah, but it just, you know, I've never actually had the chance to talk to him. So if he does listen to this, I hope he he knows how grateful I am for the work that he's done. I know he's taken a lot of heat from the social media companies recently over uh, posts on his page. You know, so just Stephen Rose, if you're listening, you know, hat tip to you, sir, you know, for for creating a place for people who are rightfully and justifiably out of the the political system that that America as enshrined, you know, for people, those people to be able to sort of meet up and chat and have honest conversations. So, well, when you start making waves and they start taking notice and they start shutting your pages down, you know, you're doing something right. I mean, I'm being threatened by Facebook right now. I'm hoping they leave the, the, the Facebook page. Hey folks, Craig here. And I'd like to let y'all know we are always looking for writers to contribute to our blog. I don't care if you have any experience or not. Two or three of our contributors had no prior experience writing, and it turns out they have a real knack for it. Our project coordinator helps them put the articles together, and she publishes them on our website and Facebook page, and you will also have the option to come on the show and go more in-depth about your article. So if you like what we're doing at The Bad Roman and would like to try your hand at writing, then send us an email at thebadromanpodcast at gmail.com. We're having a blast with this project, and we would love for you to join us and help him promote it. Now back to the show. Great article. And I'm and like I told you before, I'm really thankful that you took the time to write it for us. I don't have a lot of time to write. I'm fixing to uh, work slowing down. I'm fixing to do a study on the early church and, and write something about that. And I asked Abby if she would come on and interview me on the Bad Roman podcast. Because I thought about doing like a, a solo podcast and that would be a nightmare. I just don't know. I, I need to be able to play off to some play off of somebody and have a conversation. If I just sit here and try to mumble and talk to you about what I learned about the early church, it's not gonna it's not gonna sound good. <laughs> I already know this. Yeah, conversations are always received better. Yeah, I'm with you there. I like ones where people are talking. You feel like you're part of the conversation. Now I'm really speaking of Steven and you know, even Mike Meharry can do it too, just but listening to them do a solo podcast, they they can do that. It's like Steven's a great teacher. Like it's almost like sitting in a Sunday school class when you're listening to Steven talk. If you were sitting in a Sunday school school class listening to Craig talk, you're gonna probably nod off. Get really frustrated with about him mumbling through his, his words. <laughs> yeah, my problem is, you know, I, I don't know if there's any Dan Carlin hardcore history fans that listen to your podcast, but uh, my problem is, like, you know, if I tried to do a solo effort, I'd, I, uh, I'd end up going like five hours into a topic, and I don't think anybody would listen to it. So I'd just talk and talk and talk. <laughs> <laughs> In your article, you, you bring up that during your childhood, and you talked about it a little bit while ago, that you were taught the empire was good. And I like that the fact that you used the, the word empire because it's not used enough or people don't understand that America, the American empire is a thing. And you called it Babylon earlier. That's that's the case. It's it's no different than the Roman Empire. I mean, let's if, if we want to be honest about it, it's, it's it's an empire. It is arguably the most powerful empire that's ever existed. Yeah, I call it the uh, probably the largest terrorist organization we've ever seen, too. And that really doesn't set well with a lot of uh, state-loving Christians. because <laughs> People get very mad at you when you say that on that. That's okay. That's the point. I need them because if I can get them to think about it, then, then we can have a conversation. Because they'll, they'll come back to me around you know, later and ask me about it. Just plant some seeds. And as the time progressed, you realize it was all propaganda. I want you to expound on this a little bit because I totally get this. But for the listener, let's talk about that for a bit. How the propaganda behind this yeah, so so it's it's ingrained with how we learn about the history of the United States, right? Like it, it goes hand in hand with it. Um, we're taught, or at least I was taught. So let me let me not say we, right? Like I can only tell you my experience. And I I know people personally who've had the same experience. I was taught in school that all of the founding fathers were upright, moral Christian men, and even going back farther than that, the people who first came to America, the Mayflower, right? They they wanted to practice, they wanted to worship the way that God told them that they should worship. They wanted freedom of religion. So they came over here uh, to have freedom of religion, which is really code for Christianity, right? They, they wanted to worship 
Christianity the way they thought was best. And they came over and they encountered all these savages and, and the savages at first tried to help them via the story of Thanksgiving, but they brought civilization to these savages, you know, and then there was through whatever means determined that, you know, God was telling them to, to take more of the land from the people who already owned it that were here, you know, and then you get to British colonial times and, and the founding fathers and the sons of liberty, which is a period of history that I love, right? But we're taught that these people are super moral Christians who love Jesus and, and were on a mission from God to make the, the new Israel, essentially, right? So when you're taught this when you're young, and you're going to church and everyone that you're going to church with has been taught that same way. Uh, it seeps in and it, it essentially becomes propaganda for the, the history and the purpose and the, the origin of your country. And if, if your country was predestined by God via moral, upright Christian men that created it, then it goes without saying to a lot of folks that your nation's actions, whatever they are, are just true and right. And, and what God wants to have happen. So when we go to war, it's a holy war. It's a just war. It's a righteous war. Um, the, the, the other side is evil. We are good. They are bad. And that's what I mean when I say propaganda. Now, do I think that the government is, is or was working directly through churches to form a, a traditional sort of Soviet propaganda machine through the churches? No. But, it, but society is crafted in a certain way to keep people loyal to the empire. You need citizens that are engaged and loyal to the empire. You need them to pay taxes. You need them to volunteer to go fight and die in these wars to, to increase the power and scope of the empire. So the propaganda that comes through these churches was helpful to the country to keep the, the balance of power and to keep society glued together the way the government wanted society glued together, right? It's only more recently that when, when people of younger ages have started to fall away from the church and started to go sort of down the path of wokeness, you know, go completely a different direction, you know, and get away from church and religion and God, where they have essentially just, instead of cutting the government and the worship of state out of their religion, they cut God out of their worship of the state, right? So now we've gone down this other path where, where now we're indoctrinating children that the government is good and virtuous and the government itself is all that we need. And yes, we thought, you know, it was entwined with religion and ordained by God, but those were antiquated old ways of thinking, right? And, and part of the problem that brings that about, right, part of the, there's this fractured way of thinking about it now is that the American government and the American America as a nation have, has done some good things. Like it's accomplished a lot of good things. You can debate whether the means through which it accomplished them were right, wrong, bad, whatever, but it's also accomplished a lot of terrible things, right? Slavery was terrible. You know, I, I live in the deep South. And, and slavery is bad. And this is a debate I have to have with human beings, grown adults, all the time. I, I, people jump in and like, well, you know, these people that fought the Civil War, they weren't really that bad. Like, no, bro. They wanted to own human beings. And, and, <laughs> and like, that's not good. They wanted to mistreat their slaves. Like, it's terrible. Slavery was bad. The, what we did to the Native Americans is terrible. We stole their land. <laughs> we, we put them on reservations. We murdered them by and large. Uh, you know, you could argue, you know, some of the things like World War II, you know, I, I think is fascinating because sometimes you make an argument that the U.S. involvement in World War II isn't as terrible as some of the other things because at least we were fighting, you know, somebody like Hitler who was decidedly evil, <laughs> you know, as evil as the American government is, uh, you know, Hitler was worse, uh, you know. Um, but I think you could look at like World War II is really a turning point in history. World War II is where the American government starts to balloon. I start to become huge. And a lot of these agencies that are treading on people's quote unquote rights and doing awful things started to come into existence. The FBI, the CIA, the NSA, you know, all the alpha, what I call the alphabet squads, you know, so you get down this path where all of that was fed by this propaganda. You know, we, we were taught that because America is inherently a just and moral and ordained by God, Christian nation, that all these things that the government is doing must be good. If God ordained it, how can it be bad, right? And I think that's just, you know, it's awful. It's just awful. Well, and it's 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 crazy when you really just sit back and think about it. You know, there was a time in my life if I'd have heard this conversation, I thought that I was listening to a bunch of conspiracy theorists. You know, and but that's not the case when because when you sit back and look at man, I mean, starting all the way back to grade school. This is this. It's taught like if, if if somebody said that called it a government school, I'd have said you're a conspiracy theorist. 
Not anymore. I don't. I think that's. I think that's accurate because it's taught to us at an early age, all the way through school. Now, maybe and that's public schools. I don't know if it's different. I never went to a private school, so I don't know if it's different in private schools. But I do know I can think all the way back to kindergarten and how we were taught this. The empire is good. Everything that they're doing on the other side that we're going to fight is bad, and it is our job to do the right thing and go murder these folks. <laughs> If they oppose us, they must be evil. Therefore, they must be destroyed. And, and that's just such a, uh, you know. It lines up with this article, too, because we could talk about war all day long. But as a Christian, you're, we shouldn't support this stuff. As freedom lovers, we shouldn't support this stuff. Now, let's go to and talk about the border. We should not, as Christians, listen, and I say this all the time. I don't really care what non-Christians are saying about this. My issue is with what Christians are, how Christians are behaving, because you are a representative of Jesus Christ. You are supposed to be representing the love of Christ. And with your hatred towards people coming across the border, seeking a better life or fleeing from a country that is, is oppressive, you should be encouraging that. You should be wanting to help these folks find a better way. Or at work, we have a the, the higher up tip services uh, for when we're busy. And we just had this whole slew of folks come in from Guatemala. <laughs> they they don't speak a they don't speak a lick of English, but they're so happy. How can you hate these people? How can you have anything? They're they're just they're just trying to live their lives. They're trying to feed their families. That's all they're trying to do. And you're and you have a problem with it. They're not coming to your house asking you for food. They're actually working for it. It doesn't make any sense anymore. Yeah, no one is stealing your job. Like, no one is stealing your job. Who, you know, for all the people that say that, like, they're, they're going to cross the border and steal my job. <laughs> Raise your hand. Like, if I'm wrong, if, if there is a person who has said that and picks fruit for a living and does all the other minimum wage jobs that these folks that come across the border do, that wants to go out and do roofing, if you are a person who has had your job stolen, by a person who came across the border illegally, hit me up and I will publicly say that I'm wrong. But I'm telling you right now, these folks are not coming across the border and stealing jobs of people who are whining about, uh, you know, these the, the immigrants coming across the border. It's just not happening. Now, are they coming across the border illegally? Are they breaking a law? Technically. But don't even get me started on the fact that just because it's a law doesn't make it right. I've heard that. You know, this is another thing that I've heard, too. And this is I've heard it from I, I was talking about the guy in the break room. I've heard him. I heard him say he doesn't work there anymore. He retired. But I heard him say this. They were talking about the borders and stuff. It's always a hot topic, man. It's, it's crazy. But that he's like. I just want them to pay taxes. If you're going to come over here, pay taxes. I'm like, I don't want anybody to pay taxes. So I engaged him <laughs> with this. I was like, you, why do you want them to pay taxes? Do you want to pay taxes? He goes, well, I have to. I said, you're, you're being forced to. So you want to force somebody else to pay taxes? Man, I, I say this all the time. I, I applaud anybody that can find a way out of paying taxes. I love it. Then people get so mad about, about people not paying taxes. Like I'm, I'm applauding them. Show me your ways. I want to learn how to do this. I want to know, I want to know how to do it without getting locked in a cage <laughs> because of a law. The the federal government's budget too is so uh, unbalanced and unstable with with debt that it doesn't matter. Like we could literally import every person from South America and plug them in and have them pay taxes and and our government would find a way to spend more money than they bring in so to me that's such an irrelevant like you know and if you look at like in my article the parable of the good samaritan you know one of the things i call out is that there are no caveats to to when jesus says you know who your neighbor is you, you know your neighbor is everyone around you so long as they came here legally so long as they pay all of their taxes so long as they do x y or z jesus does not say that jesus says your neighbor is everyone love your neighbor. Uh, think about what you just said. Think about what you just said. Think about that word legally. You're 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 deeming a person a legal human being. Think just think just set that let it marinate on your brain for a little, for a little bit. Yeah, a person who is created in the image in the image of of the king of the universe, the omniscient, omnipotent, almighty creator God. Like they are created in his image and you are going to sit and tell God that you are going to stand and judge of whether or not they are a legal or illegal, worthy or unworthy person. Think of the arrogance of that statement, right? To say that that you're going to put yourself as the arbiter of that decision. It's just wild to me. Oh, it drives me crazy, man. 
That's why I was so thankful for that you wrote this because it's just something that's been really frustrating me just lately. And, and like we were talking about earlier, you know, the left has gone silent on how Biden's treating these folks at the border. There's still kids in, in cages. They're still separating these children from their families. These children, they have no idea what's going on. They're just following their mom and dad around. And now they don't know where their mom and dad is. You know, and it's not Biden is no different than Trump. I, I don't I don't I don't see any difference. Yeah. The stories of the little kids and, and I've heard like audio and, and seen video of these children, <clears throat> you know, coming across the border and just wailing. They're terrified wanting their 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 mother. You know, I have a six year old daughter. Like I think of that and it literally makes me so angry that like that's a few times that, like I, I want to fight somebody over it. Like I, I want to get up and like, you know, there's nothing I can do. I got no real power to fix it. But it just makes me so angry having a daughter myself thinking if that was me. And I'm coming here to try to better myself, you know, search for a better life. Like, and I think too, like, you know, people say all sorts of things like, uh, you know, they should come here legally. They should do this. They should do that. All of that, in my opinion, for a lot of folks is just an attempt for them to wiggle out of the commandments that Jesus has given them to love their neighbor. Right. You want to let yourself off the hook. You want to be able to say, well, Jesus, I would have, but you got to understand this didn't happen or that didn't happen. Or here's why I didn't, here's why they're not worthy of, of, you know, being your commitment, being fulfilled in, in regards to them. And I, and I think that's such a, uh, to me, that, that's such a shame. I'm glad you brought this up because I was actually going to talk about this. You mentioned this in the article and it, you, you said it's not a hundred percent correlation to American Christians and immigrants, but you're talking about the Jews and the Samaritans and you bring up Luke chapter 10 and he breaks down the barrier. And he said, then you go on and you say, Jesus plainly shows us who our neighbors are. Everyone. Yes, even the people we don't like. Yes, even people with other cultures. Yes, even people from other countries. Yes, even people who illegally cross imaginary lines on a map. Those are your neighbors. And like I said a while ago, I'm not interested in what non-Christians are saying about this. What I'm trying to get across to Christians is you're supposed to act a different way, regardless of what the state's doing, regardless of what non-Christians are doing. You you are called by Christ to love your neighbor. It's He commanded you to. It's not a suggestion. It's a commandment. Jesus didn't come down and say, listen, guys, if you're having a good day and you find some people, if you're in, if you're feeling like it and you find some people who are following rules that you think are important, you should treat those people like they're important and you should love them. (laughs) (laughs) Doesn't say any of that. It's like all these people, you know, and and I think like it's easy to, it's easy for me to go to my neighbor across the street here in my subdivision who, you know, is very nice to me all the time and, and doesn't pose any threat to me according to the the powers that be and to love him like Jesus it's it is hard to look at people who you're told by you know the news and the government are a threat to you and they want to steal your jobs and want to do all these bad things or evil terrible people coming across you know it, it is uh much harder to love those people than it is to uh you know to love the other people that are around you and and I think like people are a little bit lazy when it comes to the commandments of Jesus myself included listen I'm no per- like I'm not standing here telling you that I'm a perfect Christian that lives out all the commandments of scripture equally, but, but I am trying to be better at it. Well, God knows your heart. I mean, if you, if you know, if he knows you're trying, I mean, if you're, if you're actually pursuing that or you're in your own heart and you're trying to make this world a better place by loving your neighbor. And it's another thing to actively hate your neighbor, even when Jesus commanded you to love them. Like I said, this is where my frustration lies with Christians, you know, and you bring up and Talk about an axe. You said, we, we see just how Jesus plans to empower the disciples to accomplish this task. He said, and everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. At that time, there were, there were devout Jews from every nation living in Jerusalem. When they heard the loud noise, everyone came running and they were bewildered to hear their own languages being spoken by the believers. They were completely amazed. How can this be? They explained. These people are all from Galilee, and yet we hear them speaking in our own native languages. Here we are, Parthians, Medes, I'm going to pronounce this wrong, I'm sure, Elamites, is that right? People from Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, the province of Asia, and you just go on this list of places where all these folks are from. And it's, it's it's a very powerful imagery when you think about it. Like I was talking about the folks at work now that they can't speak a lick of English. They can feel the hatred. They have to feel it, you know, I mean, but they're happy. I mean, it's just, it's just, it's, it's it's fun for me to watch them. Like I told somebody the other day, it's, they're all sitting in break room, you know, and it sounds like a school cafeteria to me. It's just loud. 
they're laughing and joking with each other and nobody we can't understand anything they're saying, but they're having a good time. <laughs> yeah, like we want to put these barriers in place again to get ourselves out of uh living out the commandments that that Jesus the the, the story of Acts is such a cool this is such a cool story. Jesus goes up, he ascends into heaven and he tells the disciples to wait. And, you know, and, and I've always read that and I never taught anything about it. And I, I read it recently and, and then I realized that he told them to wait because he knew that there was going to be this festival going on. And I forget the name of it. And, and, and I don't want to. But anyway, there was a reason for people to be coming into the city um, from all over the, the, you know, the provinces and nations, all those those list of places um, to do business and, and to be there for a particular reason. So so God's plan is perfect. Um, in this. And then he empowers the the disciples to be able to, they're speaking their language, right? Like, so whatever, if they spoke Greek, they were speaking in Greek, but the person they were hearing it, if they spoke Phoenician, they were hearing that person speak in Phoenician. And, you know, this is the the, the classic argument against, you know, the gibberish Pentecostal speakers, right? They're speaking in tongues and, and I, whether right or wrong, I don't know, right? I don't want to go down that rabbit hole. But God worked through the disciples to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ to these people that had come from essentially all over the world. And, and the point here is two things that God is giving you a commandment and telling you to go do a thing. And if you are faithful to him, he is going to carry through on his promise and he's going to equip you to handle it and accomplish it. Secondly, you can't do it on your own. God had to have been there for those disciples to be able to reach all those people and proclaim the gospel of Jesus. So all these things we're talking about loving your neighbor realizing that everyone is your neighbor, treating them as your neighbor, living out the commandments of the gospel. I can't do it. If I were to try to do that in my own power, my own strength, I'm going to fall into the same tribalism and pettiness and, and all the bad things we talked about that government and people people do. I'm going to do that. But if I rely on the strength of Jesus Christ and I'm, I'm faithful to Jesus, God through me will accomplish more than I could ever accomplish. Right. So and I think that's really I don't know how hard I really hit that point in the article, but but I think that's an important thing, too. Like, God is not asking you just to go in your own strength and do all this stuff and be these certain ways. God is saying, if you will be faithful to me, look what I can do. The story in Acts is just, I don't know, to me, it's such a fascinating, my favorite book in the Bible is Jonah, but this is probably, you know, my favorite sort of little snippet of, of what God did through a group of people to, you know, and these, these are really, we, we want to talk about founders that should be studied and, and honored and thought about, forget the founding fathers of the United States. The, the disciples, the apostles, the original crew that went out and really started to spread the seeds of the church, you know, people, we, we should care more about learning about them and what they taught and their experience with Jesus and then what they did through the Holy Spirit than we should about George Washington. Like, you know, no offense to George Washington, but, you know, it's just one of these things where like people, people, you got to, any ism that you put ahead of Jesus, um, you know, is dangerous, right? And God, and God is telling you, if you will just follow me and do what I'm asking you to do and live the way I want you to live, I will empower you to, to do these things. And you don't have to, then at that point, if we're, we're living like Jesus wants us to live, we don't have to care about the border. We don't have to care about the border. No matter what happens at the Southern border of the United States, whatever God's will for this world is going to be accomplished. Like in the end, what God wants to have happen is going to happen whether we are rah, rah, Republicans or rah, rah, Democrat, rah, rah, Libertarian, open borders, no borders, you know, heavily militarized borders. None of that matters in the end. We should be so consumed. Our daily life should be so consumed with living the way Jesus wants us to live. We literally should not have time to care what the empire is doing with the empire's things, you know, and, and, and I, that's how I've always sort of interpreted the render unto Caesar verse, you know, and I know that's a big one amongst anarchists because the state is see it different one way. We see it another way, but like sort of rendering unto Caesar is, is, uh, you know, render what to God is God's and render what to Caesar is Caesar's. If I'm a Christian, my whole life is God's and I shouldn't have enough time to give any of it to Caesar, you know? And if I am that, you know, I need to, I need to think about that. I need to reflect on it. Well, speaking about that, the render under Caesar, and then we'll close after this, but the render under Caesar, I've always believed that Jesus and the early church were a bunch of snarks. <laughs> I mean, because when you get down to it, I mean, when he says, render under Caesar what is Caesar's and what under God what is God's, when you get down to all of it, everything belongs to God. And I think Jesus was just being a snark <laughs> to them because they were trying to ca catch him in something. He was just being snarky back to them. All right. So at the end, and you said, we'll close with this. And said, my fellow bad Romans, I ask you today to look at borders in a new light. Borders are means to an end for secular government. They serve a purpose for government, and that purpose isn't beneficial to people in need. 
Jesus did not be, need borders. He had no love or concern for their protection. So in turn, we, the image bearers of Christ, should not concern ourselves with the government drawing line, lines on, mat, on a map. Instead, we should love our neighbors, help people in need, take the love and gospel of Jesus Christ to the ends of the earth, and to all people because they are all our neighbors. No more excuses, no more borders. That was great. Do you want to talk about that? Or do you? Yeah, it's, it. you know, uh, it, I think it goes back to what I said a minute ago. I guess I kind of preempted wh- where you're going with it, but, uh, yeah. <laughs> but you, you're, you're Christians, like, you know, you're, you're first, like for me, the way my life is organized right now, uh, my first responsibility is my relationship with God. My second is my relationship with my wife then my daughter, then my job, then, you know, anarchy or anarchism, whatever, you know, rallying against the state. Um, But if my life is organized that way, you know, I'm heavily involved in my local church. My local church is not perfect. No church is. It's filled with human beings. No human beings are perfect. My goal as I go on, and I'm not, listen, I don't, I don't do this all the time. I'm not doing this perfectly. My goal is to fill my day up with the things that Jesus wants me to do and the way that Jesus wants me to act towards people to fill my day up with that so much that I don't have time to get caught being part of the rabble that cares about things like borders and government. I don't think you can make a case, you know, a lot of people say, Oh, we should try to tear down the government and and oppose it violently. I don't think you can make a scriptural case to violently oppose a government. I just don't like the more I look at it, you know, we've talked about pacifism is a thing that's debated heavily amongst anarchist Christian circles, right? Like, but I don't think that we have to, we don't owe any of our time to the government. I am not under any obligation to spend time fixing, changing, moving the government in a certain direction. I owe my time to loving people like Jesus would love them. Uh, my church today, we just launched this initiative in the next, you know, 10 years, we want to plant a hundred churches. We want to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ to the, around the world if possible, but you know, in our local area, whatever. Uh, and, and that's really our focus. Like, I want to teach my daughter to love Jesus. I want to teach my daughter that her self-worth is is based in what God thinks of her and sees in her and the reason he created her and not what the world tells her, right? Like, my, my, my number one goal, how I should spend my time, is to follow Jesus, follow his commandments, love my neighbors. And I believe that God is strong enough and powerful enough and smart enough to work everything else out towards whatever goal he has for the end of the universe. And, you know, I I believe, I know there's debate amongst anarchist Christians about parts of the Bible, you know, not being as important as the things that Jesus said. I do believe that, that scripture is complete and intact. I'm still one of those guys that believes it is, is what it says it is. So I think where the Bible tells us we're going to end up is a new heaven and a new earth with God. And in the meantime, my only goal, well, how I should spend almost all of my time is proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ and loving my neighbor. Yep, that's it. I mean, that's it. That's what I said earlier. I said uh, all that st- other stuff is just stuff to me. And just if I can just keep it simple and follow to the best of my ability what Jesus taught us, what he commanded us to do, then it, everything else is just going to kind of fall in place. And God's going to do that. It's not what Craig's going to do. It's not what Josh is going to do. God's going to do that. So we just follow that commandment to love our neighbor and that include those folks that are trying to come across the border and seek a better life. I mean, I've, I've worked with uh, folks from El Salvador now, I'm saying Guatemala and Mexico, and man, they're just trying to feed their families. That's all they're trying to do. There's nothing wrong with that. We should we should encourage that. We should actually applaud them for wanting to take care of their families. And these folks, man, they come to work. They come to work every day. And even if they're not, even if they're coming here for nefarious reasons, guess what the most powerful thing is in the history of the world to change someone's life? The gospel of Jesus Christ. We're still to proclaim the gospel, even if they're not coming for, for, for good reasons, good, bad, or indifferent. The people that you meet are created in the image of God, love them like Jesus. God will work the rest out. And, and I think like, that's just such a, it's such a freeing thought for me anyway. Exactly. It is exactly. It is freeing. And it's just, you're, it really just, when you simplify it, I keep saying that, but it just, it, it's because it can get exhausting sometimes, but man, when you sim- make it simple, keep it, keep, keep everything simple. It's perfect. Man, I appreciate uh, you writing for us. And guys, if y'all have not read this, I encourage you to go check out his article at thebadroman.com. And is there anything you'd like to plug before I let you go? No, just, you know, if you're in any of the discussion groups, hit me up, send me a friend request. Um, you know, if you think I'm wrong, tell me I'm wrong. Um, any of my terrible opinions you disagree with, obviously, <laughs> send to me, not to Craig. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so, you know, but uh, I, I love a good conversation. I love a good debate. I, you know, 
uh, the one last parting shot I'll give is is anarchist friends don't let anarchy be to you what politics is to the folks that we've sort of left behind right love Jesus more than you love anarchy or anything else and and other than that Craig you know this has been a blast for me I've had a ton of fun and I appreciate you letting me come on the show yeah man we'll have to do it again I enjoy speaking with you I think you and I've gone back and forth some on social media as well so but it's it's all it's all good I mean it's not yeah it's like we hate each other afterwards we, because I, I like a debate because I think I think if I'm debating somebody I'm trying, I'm trying to learn something new as well you know, because I really, I know this is going to sound stupid, but sometimes I, I like being wrong. I think you learn, you can learn a lot uh, from failures and being wrong, you know, just like you can from, from doing things well. So yeah, I agree. Well, it's, it's not embarrassing to me to be wrong. You know, it used to be like, I was like, I had to be right about everything, but now if it's not, it's, it doesn't bother me to be wrong anymore. because <laughs> I've been wrong about so many things. I mean, look where we came from. Yeah. <laughs> you know, anyway, I don't want to get down to the rabbit hole. Like I was wrong about so many things politically before and like the way I thought about Jesus. And, you know, so, so I, I, you know, I go through the day fully thinking that on any given point thing, I could be wrong. And, and I think, you know, that's a healthy attitude also. Like, don't be so arrogant that you think you have everything figured out all the time. You know, there's certain things we know are true. Everything else, you know, be willing to discuss. So. Yeah, I think I've come across as a jerk to people, and I get it. I mean, I am a jerk. I, I, I know that about me, but and I apologize if, if to people, you know, if I've been that way. But it's just kind of part of my nature. I'm pretty from West Texas, and we do know everything down in West Texas. I don't, I don't, I don't know if people are aware of that, but that's where God lives. <laughs> yeah, I was down in Texas visiting some friends when the whole uh, ice storm happened, and uh, a lot of Texans' confidence was shaken. They didn't feel like they knew what the heck to do. <laughs> In some of that weather they were having, so it's pretty fun. Yeah. But anyway, all right, buddy, man, I'm gonna let you get out of here and get back to your day and, and go spend some time with your family. But yeah, this is really cool, and I really appreciate you coming on and speaking with me. And this has been this has been a fun conversation. Thanks for joining us this week on the Bad Roman Podcast. Be sure to subscribe to the show wherever you find your podcasts to never miss an episode. And while you're at it, if you like what you heard, we'd appreciate a rating on iTunes. Or if you'd simply tell a friend about the show, it really helps people find us. 100% of donations are given to local charities in Memphis, Tennessee. To learn more about The Bad Roman Project and to find show notes, please visit thebadroman.com. Bad Roman.